Not just boxing are here to announce our proud sponsors, ETS. Yep, Eco Technology Solutions, specialising in the repair of laptops, tablets, mobile phones. Uh, they're, they're hot businesses and consumers in the southeast. So if you use the code FIX with not just boxing, you'll get 25% off. The link is in the description. Go check it out. Thanks, guys. Cheers, guys. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all well. My name's Terry. I'm here with Ash today. Uh, we've got a very special guest today, uh, Jack Coax. Jack is one of the leading nutritionists in the South Coast, working with some top prospects and some top boxers around this area. Jack, how you doing? Wicked, mate. Thanks for having me on. I'm buzzing to have a quick chat with you guys and um, pick some of your brains as well about yeah. nutrition and boxing and stuff. So, yeah. Amazing. We're very That's excited cool. to find out more about nutrition. Yeah. Uh, so, I think, first of all, how did you sort of get involved in nutrition? What's your background in it? Yeah, so originally I trained to be a chef. So when I was little, I always wanted to be a chef. I used to cook with my mum. And then, yeah, I wanted to chase that. So I went to college, did um, catering, culinary stuff at Brockenhurst College. So I did that, but then quickly found out that even though I really loved it and loved doing the food and stuff, doing the cooking, and I was really creative, just wasn't really, um, wasn't really for me. I got a couple of jobs as a chef and the pressure of it just didn't really suit my personality, to be honest. So... I decided that I wanted to go to university. I still wanted to keep that kind of involvement with food. Was in, interested heavily in the science behind kind of like what was on the plate. Um, wanted to learn way more about kind of like biochemistry and physiology and how the what we eat kind of affects our like performance, not just in sport, but just in day to day life, like, you know, injury, illness, like energy levels, you know, it's obviously massively important, you know, food, otherwise I wouldn't have a job if I didn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of went to St. Mary's University in Twickenham. Nice, yeah. Um, and did a three year degree there in human nutrition and biochemistry. And then in the third year, just kind of decided, yeah, obviously you've got to then decide what you want to go in and do. Do you want to do clinical? Do you want to do like public health? Do you want to work in hospital? Um, for me, it was always like sports. So I was like, you know, really sporty growing up. I thought, yeah, okay, I'm going to do sports nutrition. So went and did a master's then at Oxford Brooks University. Did that for a year. What did was, you uh, What did you do for your dissertation? My dissertation at undergrad was looking at. Um, it's a bit of a weird one. So it was looking at the effects of panax ginseng, which is like a herb, like mm. Chinese herb. Yeah, I know ginseng. On, yeah. yeah, yeah. On um, anaerobic exercise performance. So there was some like, oh god, throwing back the years. I'm trying to remember it. Um, I might read it later now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was like looking at the effects of that on basically like markers of anaerobic exercise performance. So I gave people like different dosages of ginseng mm -hmm. and see if it basically improved their like wing gait, so like sprint performance on a bike. Um, Did it? No. No? <laughs> no. I bought no. into ginseng because it's an adaptogen, right? It helps you with uh, stress, etc. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I bought into it because I thought it was good. I was taking it every day, but while I had such a good diet and I was training, I didn't know if the ginseng was helping or not, but I just had it as part of my supplements. Yeah, yeah. so that was, that was the kind of thought process behind it. Obviously, it negates the amount of stress put on the body at like maximum intensity. So mm -hmm. it was just like, yeah, give it a go. But yeah, so I did that as my dissertation at, um, at undergrad, then went on to Oxford Brooks, which is a big difference from undergrad because doing kind of like a BSc on undergrad is obviously you're at uni. I was playing a lot of sport. What doing, sports were you playing? Um, I was doing squash, tennis, rugby. So I was doing like quite a lot of sport. I heard you were quite a good squash player as well. Yeah, pretty decent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, enjoyed enjoyed doing that. Enjoyed the uni life, and then obviously get older. Masters is completely different. Like mm. my brothers have both done masters. One of them's done PhD, and he said, yeah, you know, this is completely different to doing a. Everyone does a BSc. Mm -hmm. um, it was very much like I was treating it like you know this is my job. This is a career this is like a business expense. You know, I always thought that I'm paying for this master's out of my own money this time. This is kind of like a, a business expense, which I'm going and doing. I'm taking this proper serious. Um, reading research papers on the train up there, not going out drinking, just focused. Um, so did that. And then what whilst, modules did you cover in your master's? Um, so we did a lot of practical stuff. So it was way more doing stuff in the labs. It was way more work going out into the field and working with athletes. Um, and this is kind of ties in where I started working in boxing. So I didn't know like what sport I wanted to go into um, and start working with people. We had to do a case study where we had to find, go out into the world and find an athlete mm -hmm. and then like give them a nutrition intervention and help them solve a problem. Cause that's basically what 
you know, personal training, strength conditioning, nutritionist, someone's got a problem, and then the PT or the nutritionist is there to solve the problem. Um, so I started working with a professional boxer from around here called Bailey Donald, I've heard of him. Yeah. Um, so his S&C coach randomly, as I was about to do this case study, came up to me in the gym and he said, Jack, have you got a minute? Can you grab a coffee with you? And I said, yeah, sure. So I've got this guy, Bailey, he needs to kind of make weight for this fight. Struggling a little bit, only eating, I can't remember what it was at the time, maybe one, one meal a day or something, a couple of snacks. So I was thinking like, okay, well, he's on like 1,200 calories then. Bit of a crash diet. Bit of a crash diet, not performing well in training, etc. cetera. Um, met up with him and his dad, obviously his S&C coach, Max, and, um, Yes, I said, so this is what we're going to do, to come down to Southampton Solent Uni. They have a good performance centre over there, don't they? Really good. Really good performance centre, yeah. Really good, yeah. So took him, took him down there, got him, got his body comp done. So sort of found out like, you know, how much muscle mass he had, how much fat mass he had. And then off the back of that, put in a nutrition plan. How long, how long did you have? I think it was about six weeks. The annoying thing with, with it was though, his fight got, postponed because it was literally when COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So I think it was like the day before COVID happened, he was supposed to fight York Hall. So obviously he kind of like made weight, was on weight and then, yeah, just fight didn't happen. But, but I wrote that case study up, um, got it on my laptop actually. And then obviously like published that. Um, and that was kind of how I got into boxing. But at the time I was just a bit like, yeah, I know a lot about nutrition, but I don't know anything about boxing really. Mm. Um, and I, I guess just, you knew it all on paper, but the practicality of having someone in front of you that's, yeah. Yeah, and boxing's very like different. If you were to go to, oh, I'm trying to think like, 55 year old cyclist that's bang into his cycling, and you say, I'm gonna do this, 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 and this, and they're like, yeah, that's wicked, I'll spend like two grand on this, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but boxing, they're kind of a bit, almost reluctant to, to kind of get advice. So, you know, I learned, I know a lot of boxers that wanna do things, you know, head down, work hard, you know, overtrain, all this kind of stuff. They don't like, you know, you don't need to go into scientific detail with them. There's a lot of old school methods that are still drilled, which... Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good thing now. Nutrition is, is a great thing, it's educating people. But in the old school, you've got a lot of still old school mindsets, which is good, because you need that in, in a sport like boxing, but there's ways that it can be improved through nutrition, through strength and conditioning, uh, through visualization, these sort of things can yeah. certainly help. And it's a good thing these sort of things are slowly but they're getting implemented. There's people like yourself that are taking the sport forward, I would say. Yeah, so I think we've got to be a little bit careful with nutrition and boxing and things like strength conditioning um, as well, to be fair, of, of overcomplicating things. I think a lot of people in society and in combat sports boxing make nutrition more complicated than it actually needs to be. Mm. And in truth, if you nail kind of like the basic fundamentals, like, you know, you're drinking enough fluid throughout the day, you know, you're not dehydrated going into your sessions. You're eating like a good carbohydrate rich meal before sparring or like a heavy training session. You're hitting your calorie target. You're including lots of fruits and veg with different meals. I think these are the things you kind of need to be nailing on a consistent basis. And if you're not nailing those things, you then need to kind of do a deep dive and think like, okay, why am I not doing these things? Is it lack of preparation? Is it, you know, like cost effectiveness? Can I not afford these foods, you know? environment around you and bits and bobs like this as opposed to you know a lot of people want to jump on the latest thing like we were saying off air like you know what supplements should i take or mm -hmm. what time of day should i try to do intermittent fasting it's like you know if you get the basics right and you can perform well in training then you can then look to add those one two percents but they only really come the higher up you get in performance so in if you if you let's say someone's listening to this now and it, amateur boxer for example what would be the basic guideline you would say before they start trying to experiment with anything else? Obviously, get correct sleep, get your diet on point with the vegetables you said, fruit. Yeah, sleep is probably the biggest one as well. I would say like the three kind of like pillars or rocks. You've got sleep, obviously like hydration, and then overall energy intake diet, I guess. So sleep, I was having a conversation with one of my guys yesterday. I won't call him out, but um, we were saying how he's just like raging hungry, just like all the time at the moment. And I was thinking like, well, he's having like five, six meals a day. Do you know what I mean? Like smaller meals and things like that. I was thinking like, why is he so hungry? And it turns out it's, it's his sleep. Mm -hmm. Getting up proper early before work, because a lot of people don't realize amateur pro boxers, you know, all of them pretty much, if you're fortunate to be sponsored, all of them do have like day jobs. So they work, you know, nine, you know, to, five nine to five or seven till five or- Train twice a day. Train yeah. first thing in the morning, train in the evening. So they're getting up at, you know, 4 a.m. or 4.30 a.m. to go for like a 
pad session or like a slow jog or whatever they're going to do. But they're going to sleep at you know 10, half 10, 11. They're only getting five hours sleep. And what they don't realize is that affects hunger hormones massively. So they're just got a raging appetite throughout the day. What's so. the recommended sleep you would say for someone who, d who does, if they work during the day and then they have to do training as well, what's the recommended sleep you would say for, is suitable for, I guess for anybody really? Yeah, it's going to be between sort of like seven and nine hours, but it's one of those ones where you need to focus on the quality of your sleep as opposed to, I got eight hours sleep. Because when you actually maybe like wear a, you know, trackable device like a whoop band or a polar watch or something, you can actually see, okay, well, the REM sleep, the deep sleep was only, I don't know, half an hour. Mm -hmm. So out of that sleep, it's got eight hours. I was, you know, I have my eyes shut for eight hours, but you're actually asleep for like five and a half with quality sleep. Um, I know you had Mike on, Mikey on last week and he wears like a watch which tracks his sleep. So I can look at his sleep and say, okay, you actually got X amount of hours sleep last night. Um, and it's always a Saturday morning where he gets like the best sleep. Cause obviously he's not got to get up early to go training. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of the ones which is it's like massive and plays a big role in diet. And there are some things with diet which you can implement to like improve your sleep, like having melatonin rich foods like cherries before bed. So you can have like yogurt and some cherries or, you know, science and sport and other companies sell like cherry kind of like gels, which you can put in with green tea and have that before bed and that improves your sleep quality. And Would you stuff have like that. lots of carbohydrates in the evening too? Does that help you sleep? Yeah, so if you kind of have like high GI or high glycemic index carbs before bed, um, but this is the catch 22. If you said that's a boxer, they'd be like, I'm not having any carbs before I bed. I, I, yeah. I nearly panicked when you said carbs at night. I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. After, have... after six o'clock, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you have carbs, well, well, I was thought if you have things like carbs at night, it's not good for you. There's so, this is quite there's so much so conflicting good. evidence, but yeah. for, for you to have good quality sleep, you it's good to have a big meal at night. Cause like you, everyone, everyone knows when you have a big meal, you want to go to sleep, right? You're tired. If you have a Sunday roast or something, or it depends what time you have it as well. I think that again, for me, I think that's opposite. If I have too much to eat, I find it hard to sleep. Yeah, it's on your yeah, it's on your chest. So I don't know how how, how many I, hours do you have it like? A let's say I'd have dinner at half six, yeah. and I'm going to bed about half nine. So three hours, three hours for it to digest. But yeah, that, that works pretty well. Yeah, three hours. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people eat really late at night as well. So that's another thing I see with the boxers is that maybe they train at like I don't know, 7 p.m. like you said after work and they'll get home at half eight shower and then they'll eat a big meal at nine o'clock mm. and then they weren't not, not able to go to sleep till 11 30 12 and then getting up at five the next day because they can't sleep because all the blood's going to their stomach yeah. to digest the food so yeah it's this kind of like a catch-22 I remember the guy I was talking about saying like well yeah it's literally a catch-22 because I need rest, but I've got to get up early because I've got to do like my cardio session because I need to create expenditure to lose this weight. Mm. Um, so yeah. Your case study when you had the weight cut, uh, how much weight did he lose? Yeah, obviously I'm, I have to probably like go on my laptop later and have a little look for it, but it was around, I remember him starting the camp at around 74, 74 and a half kilos. I think it was an eight week camp. Um, obviously getting down to welterweight, 66.7. There's a catch weight, it's around like 67, 68. Um, but obviously you want to be professional and try to be as close to it as you can. You don't want to be like just on 68 because it doesn't send the right message out, does it? So, um, yeah, so it was around kind of like 0.7 to one kilo a week, um, of fat mass. And we tried to maintain the amount of muscle mass that he had because he's still growing. He's only a young guy. So trying to just maintain his kind of like high protein intake throughout the day. So it's around like 2.2, 2.5 grams per kilo body weight. Would so you just, say that was quite a high weight cut compared to other fighters? No, not really, because cause he had the body fat to lose. Um, and when you've got more body fat, more of it comes off. Um, if you're, you're, he wasn't 22%, but if you were 22% body fat, you're going to lose more kind of like fat per week than you would if you were, you know, you're only like 10%. So it's a bit more of a struggle, do you know what I mean? So, and when you obviously said you're up in his protein, yeah, did he also up his calories as well as, because a lot of people, obviously your calorie deficit and your calorie maintenance, you can maybe go for a walk, train a bit extra, and then eat a bit more of good food. Yes. That could help you with performance, so. Yeah, so he was doing kind of like zone two, zone three, um, kind of like fat max, you know, below like 140 heart rate, low intensity runs in the morning, fasted. So they, were, they weren't taking anything out of him, as in like they weren't depleting any fuel stores, they weren't putting any kind of like excess strain on his body, but he was creating that calorie deficit. 
and then he was then kind of like periodizing his carbohydrates. So like for breakfast, we'd obviously have like some overnight oats or some porridge. Lunch, maybe some like fajita wraps or something like that. A grenade bar in the afternoon or some protein yogurt or milkshake or something. And then train again in the evening and come back home, have dinner and then maybe have a little something before bed. So we were spacing his protein intakes out every three, four hours just to make sure that he was maximizing kind of like feeding windows so that he wasn't losing any muscle. Because mm -hmm. what I think a lot of these young professionals do like if they did intermittent fasting or they skip meals out or like they don't eat after evening training sessions they're not allowing their body to recover and when you're in a calorie deficit your body burns several things it will burn fat which is what we want it to lose but if you also kind of get the diet wrong your body will break down protein so when you're in like a catabolic state where your body's breaking itself down which is what it is and when you're in an energy deficit your body will start to break down protein as well mm. so if, if, for example if you did like fasted cardio in the morning and you start creeping up to like a max intensity or it starts you know it's not low intensity and it starts creeping up to like high intensity your body will break down muscle protein to create glucose to create carbs for the brain if you kind of like learn a low carb state overnight so you got to be careful of like you know these young guys wanting to like cut weight but they're still growing into their kind of like man frame and um it could, could it could it sort of stop their growth if they're not eating properly, if they're not having the right nutrients, if they're cutting down on food, can that stern their growth? Yeah, yeah, I've, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was a research paper that followed like a pro boxer from Liverpool that did this, followed him like camp to camp and he just like, basically just wasn't like growing. Mm. So the potentially the, the consequence of consecutive weight cuts doing it wrong, yeah. kind of like shunting his growth. So he never kind of like grew into like his, you know, full kind mm. of like frame. You see a lot of people naturally fill out when they stop boxing or they're out out of season or they're out of camp like that you naturally fill out of course you're not in a calorie deficit anymore or whatever i'm, off, but I'm still haven't filled up how old are you oh i'm, I'm in my 30s now <laughs> you're in your prime i'm in my prime he wants me to go back he's saying <laughs> 32 that's a good age so a lot of people obviously when you, when you naturally fill into your body look at joe calzaghi right he stops boxing he stopped you know all of calorie men he just got wham he just yeah. got huge i think a lot of people they just start eating regularly it and, and you just fill out naturally i think as well a good example because you had him on last week and um, hopefully you get him on for an episode mikey's brother lucas yeah. um you look at his body shape if, if you could kind of ha have a look at his instagram or some pictures of him when he was kind of like 19 20. And he, I think he's only just kind of grown into his full body. And he was fighting at uh, featherweight or super featherweight, weighing 59 kilos. And, um, you know, just saying that, you know, it's getting harder and harder to make that weight. But it's because you're still growing into your full kind of like body. So you're still going through growth until you're like 25, 26. Yeah. Most okay, people, how so. old is he as well? I think he's the same age as me, 24. Okay. 24, 25. So, you know, it's a good example of um, as you're growing still, you kind of need to potentially move weight categories as you move because you've got to take that into consideration that you're still growing and yeah obviously like having a low protein intake not having the right foods having one meal a day it's going to stunt your growth um and if you don't have the right amount of muscle mass you can't produce enough yeah. power force production so a good example tio lopez he's he's moving up weights but he was maintaining lightweight for so long and he's just such He's naturally, he's genetics, he's such he's a funny. big guy. And obviously them weight cuts, the more muscle you got, obviously the more water weight you can cut. True, but yeah. it gets to the point of, he's only like what, 24, 25, mm. he's quite young. But 23, yeah. he's had to move up already because when, when you see the size of him compared to other lightweights, uh, you do, you, it makes you think, how do you even make that weight anymore? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, holding on, to, holding on to that, you soon realize, even though you're getting bigger, you're gonna have to back yourself, get your strength and conditioning right, and then just move up a weight category. Yeah, and that's it because strength and conditioning is becoming more and more popular, um, as well as nutrition. All you know, all boxers now have a S and C coach, whether it's like a right one or a wrong one. That's a topic for another day. But they all want to do S and C because they they recognise the importance of producing power and being powerful, not just kind of having that amateur style of like you know tap and move and fast pace. They want to be strong. They want to knock people out. Um, so yeah, it's super important that they're fighting and feeling strong at their weight class, which is something which I'm pretty heavy on. Is that Obviously, we're going to get on and talk about weight cuts, but fighting at the right weight class and keeping performance up here as opposed to just, you know, sacrificing all of the performance just to make a weight for 10 seconds. It's people forget that you actually got to go and fight someone for like half an hour. Yeah, I think people that focus too much on weight, 
it's it, you shouldn't be focusing your energy on that i saw an instagram post you put up i'm pretty sure recently but like if you're focusing so much on your weight and not your boxing or whatever competition you're in then it you know it takes over and you yeah like you said you don't get maximum performance and let me give an example so any kind of like tennis player all they're thinking about is when they go on court is practice 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 they're fueling up for their tennis sessions they're not probably not even that bothered about what weight they obviously need to be within maybe i don't know 80 to 84 kilos you know just so that they know where they're at but um they're focusing on just fueling their court sessions they're not thinking about like oh i might skip breakfast before my tennis two hour tennis session today because i need to be x weight mm. or i won't drink any water before my you know my tennis match today because i need to lose weight they're focusing predominantly on performance but if you fight at the right weight class and get the right help nice plug there um you know you're going to perform way better than if you're performing at like a weight class, which you just shouldn't be campaigning at. So let's move on to obviously with certain diets, there's restrictive diets. You've got people that can cut carbs. Uh, you've got keto, vegans, etc. Um, should we go through one by one maybe? Just a quick overview on what, yeah, what you go think. On, yeah, go on, yeah. What do you think about, first of all, cutting carbs? People that just yeah restrict carb intake and just try and cut weight that way. Yeah, but the, this is the thing, because you will get like a decent amount of weight loss from cutting carbs. Um, and I think that's where people hang on to it. Because if you cut carbs out of your diet, you lose all of the kind of like storage, I guess, in your muscle. So when you eat carbs, they get stored in the muscle. You use them during exercise. Um, and if you're weighing yourself frequently, those fluctuations are basically just due to carbohydrate intake. So if you weigh yourself before a session, you're going to be heavier than obviously after it, because you're losing the carbs, you're losing the water attached to it. So when you do like a keto diet or low carb diet, you lose like quite a lot of weight at the start and then people go, oh my God, oh my God, you know, I'm losing all this weight. This is amazing. This is sick. Um, and then what starts to happen is then obviously naturally that weight loss starts to just plateau and just stay steady. Mm. And is most of that water weight that you're seeing? Cause obviously carbohydrates hold water. So yeah. as soon as you cut carbs and the water in your body, if you naturally hold in three kilos less water. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. But then what you find is that because they're not putting, you know, the right fuel, so carbohydrates are basically the main energy source, not just for, people think just for the muscles and, you know, but for the brain as well. The brain uses glucose, the brain's a muscle. So office workers and stuff that are staring at computers all day, their brains are using glucose. So if they're on a low carb diet, the body will break down protein, like you said, to create that. So. Yeah, because a lot of people think you're, you can metabolically switch to burn, uh, switch to burning fat obviously, because you can burn fat for fuel. But how many people don't actually burn fat, they are just cutting into their stores. Because when you go into keto and you become fat adapted mm. and you can start you know, using ketones for your brain source, like a lot of people, I think, do it wrong. See, see a big start of, like, they cut a lot of water weight, but they think they're doing it okay. And the reality is you're just, you're fatiguing your body, you're, you're cutting into your, your, your essential organs. And I say and, like the, the number one thing is they'll go and do, cause, cause no boxing session is, is not intense. Yeah. The slow runs like are basically there just to build an aerobic base. They're there to create 400 calorie, 500 calorie deficit before they have breakfast. That's, that's why boxers will do low intensity runs. If you went outside and there was 10 boxers lined up out there and you ask them why they do running in the morning, it's not for like, it's not for like fitness. It's cause they want to burn some calories or it's because it's an old school thing, you know? Um, and I know like a lot of boxers now will do like what bike sessions or do, you know, I even had work with a couple of boxers that said like, I don't want to do running because I'm keeping it below a certain heart rate. So I'm achieving that goal, but it's so taxing on my knees and ligaments and, you know, going out in the cold, I'd rather go down the gym and shadow box. Mm -hmm. Cause then I'm working on my technique. I'm keeping my heart rate low, but it's boxing specific. So there's now kind of like a shift towards like, I always say to like someone, I remember saying to Mikey ages ago, like, so why are you doing hill sprints at like 10 PM and not recovering afterwards? And he's like, I don't know. And I think it's the thing, a lot of boxers don't know why they're doing certain things. It's, it's, it's the old school way, yeah. but that mentality, they want you to be tough. You know, that you see Mayweather, he's going on a run at three in the morning, you know, he's got, he'll leave the club sober and he'll go on a run and he'll, everyone will see like, you know, this guy, he, he trains whenever. So but, there's something behind it. Yeah. Someone that, like it's Mayweather it's, it's, can do it if he knows that while you're sleeping, I'm training. It's that sort of mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that gives you that mental edge over your opponent as well. So that's where that old, old school mentality has an advantage as well. And I think, I, it, I think it's always context as well, because 
if you were, for example, following someone like, I don't know, Tyson Fury, he's got a ridiculous amount of weight to lose. And I mean, we don't know because we weren't in that camp. Oh, what, well, we're going back? To three, Keto, yeah. Are we so, going back to three, four years when you put all that yeah. weight on? Yeah, with yeah. Ben Davis. So yeah. we, we don't actually know what happened. That could all be for media. He could have been having like high carb drinks before training. We, we don't know, but apparently in the papers, he's going keto for X amount of weeks. Dirty keto, he did, Dirty yeah, like keto. burgers and cheese. And yeah. Look, up, look sorry, so this is from, from me. I, I've never done a keto diet. I don't know what it is. What, what is a keto diet? What, do, what does it actually do? So it's basically like really low carbohydrates. So it's around like less than 30, 40 grams carbohydrates per day. So it's predominantly a high fat diet. So it's not like high protein as in like you eat kind of like 90% protein. It's he heavily kind of like fat based. So you're eating a lot of things like eggs, avocados, like nut butters, oils, stuff like that, obviously with protein source. So like, I guess a typical day would be something like you'd have like bacon and eggs and cheese for breakfast and avocado. Okay. Lunch, you'd have, you know, like cold meats and like some like salad or something like that. Um, you know, like Greek yogurt. So it's basically like replacing the calories from carbs with fats basically. Um, but yeah, going back to what I was saying about like that Tyson Fury thing, is that a lot of people, because it's in the headlines, will see that and think like, oh, he's doing that. So I'm gonna do that because mm -hmm. he's X person and he's really great. Um, they'll follow that. But what they don't understand is that's context dependent. So if he was trying to shift a, a lot of weight and perhaps his body wasn't ready to do any high intensity training, then that's context specific. But what you would probably see is loads of boxers that are going and doing like 12 rounds pads, one seven, 170, 180 heart rate, max intensity, yeah. And then they think, oh, I'm gonna do a keto diet. Then they do it, and then they just can't, they just don't they have the crash. energy. To, yeah, they crash. And a lot with keto as well, a lot of those guys will say that your body creates its own glycogen stores. Hmm. It's called like gluconeogenesis, where your body will naturally create. So let's say you are on keto and you go on a run, all of the glycogen stores that you need to re replenish, your body will do it itself. But it's not as good as it sounds because you don't actually replace that much. You know, like you're going to fatigue, you're going to get muscle cramps. You're... And that's what I'm saying with that gluconeogenesis is that that glucose has got to come from somewhere because you're not putting a leukosate sport in, you're not putting pasta in, etc. So it's got to come from somewhere and it comes from breaking down the muscle. So when someone is on a keto diet, they'll, and they're doing max training, they'll get muscle soreness because their body is literally breaking down its muscle to create that because body is such a clever system it'll keep going and going and it'll find a way to create like if you're in the desert you survive for a matter of days because your body's hormones and stuff will help you hold on to water it won't just like it'll you'll stop sweating your body will try and it's best to survive where our bodies are like that so very adaptable yeah very adaptable so um you know with these keto diets and stuff another really good example actually is you know like team sky cycling yeah hmm. they put up a post like ages ago of what chris threw mate and it was like eggs and salmon and avocado for breakfast and everyone's like oh if you want to do cycling you need to eat but you told me that i need to have 80 grams of carbs per hour when i'm cycling and all this but what they didn't realize is he was doing like six hour steady state like such low heart rate rides to build that aerobic base and fat metabolism but because there was no context there, just yeah. with like the Tyson Fury thing, people see it and go like, I'm gonna go for a, like a four hour cycle ride over hills and stuff. And I'm gonna just eat like smoked salmon and scrambled eggs before I go. Um, makes no so, yeah, sense, It makes it? no sense, yeah. <laughs> uh, so next, going into sort of vegans. So as we're restricting certain yeah. diets, so restricting meats and yeah. certain proteins, uh, what's your view on vegans? I know you work with a couple, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> difficult to work with. Not them personally. <laughs> I mean, just obviously when you, your a vegan diet is very restrictive and there are a lot of food groups which you obviously can't have. Um, and for me as a nutritionist, it's, I'm not, I'm not a vegan myself. So it it's, can be difficult to know like what meals to put together for them or what to suggest. But I guess some kind of key considerations to look out for a vegan diet is you're gonna be taking out a lot of protein from the diet and you're going to be taking out a lot of things like B vitamins and iron. Um, can that stuff be replaced though? It can. Is it through, vitam is it through tablets and vitamins and stuff like that? Or is it, can natural food sources give you that sort of protein and vitamins and stuff that you- Natural food with? sources can, but we're in a society where people are lazy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so how would you do a vegan diet correctly? What would you recommend? So what I've seen, just personal experience of, you know, looking at people's food diaries and speaking to people about vegan diets 
you look at their kind of like food diaries and it's just like they're doing a vegan diet but not what you would in your head paint out to be a vegan diet it's just lazy it's mm. just like chicken nuggets but soya chicken nuggets like good it's stuff al- it's almost like they've <laughs> wanted to go vegan <laughs> but they're still eating meat products yeah yeah they just find the replacement that yeah because yeah, you would think okay they're making i don't know they're making soups or they're making stir fries with tofu and loads of veg and fresh peppers and stuff or yeah. they're having you know soya yogurt and they're having you know like bran flakes or wheat bix for the iron or they're having lots of different fruits etc but when you look at it they're just having just yeah just like junk food mm-hmm. yeah that's, um, that's a huge part because isn't they it? can't be asked to do the planning for it it's like they've decided that they want to make this big change they want to go vegan but they they can't be asked to kind of like actually sit down and plan it out okay well i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna lose all of these things from the diet i was having how am i gonna plan it so i replace them you mm-hmm. know and like you were saying about trying to get things in through supplements i mean yeah you can but again that's almost like the lazy route it's almost like i'm gonna go vegan i'm gonna eat like no fruit and veg but it's all right because i'll take like a b vitamin supplement yeah i'm gonna take an iron supplement whereas i was eating lots of red meat before i was eating you know other iron rich foods um i think the key ones to think about with the vegan diet is obviously like the protein and combining the different protein sources so combining things like you know soy and um like beans and stuff like that. Um, actually, whey like, protein as well. You can get the, the uh, yeah, the like you can get yeah. whey. Like now in the industry, like there's so many good protein powders that are vegan based, like pea protein. I've heard they're the best. Some, and they're some actually, of the they're best. actually like they used to. I'm not no word of a lie. Used to try them like a few years ago, and they taste like absolute garbage, like horrible, like yeah. sand. But now they're actually like nicer than like whey protein. Yeah. Some of the protein powders, especially <laughs> chocolate. Like yeah. because of cocoa, it's natural. Like if you have a chocolate whey protein supplement and it's vegan, like it's it's natural, it's full of goodness, and it it tastes like chocolate. You know, it's yeah. got this um this vegan market's grown massively. It's worth, it's worth billions of pounds now. But uh, five years ago, I was like, this is silly. But yeah. slow, these people are slowly, slowly convincing me that it's the way forward. Like, but forward, it's, it's a trend right now. It's, it's a trend. Like, it's a see... trend. But I can see the health benefits behind it. It's a it's a trend, and usually with trends, trends kind of like die off, and there'll be something new that will come in the next few years, like where we only eat mackerel or something, or <laughs> something. we only eat like parsnips or something random. Do you know what I mean? So, um, I think uh, as well with with a vegan diet, you're naturally going to eat more carbs. Yeah. So I think that's where people get jump on board, and perhaps they were maybe having a plate of before they're having like chicken a bit of carbs and some veg whereas yeah. now their plate is predominantly carbs and that's why they perhaps feel better in training mm. but a lot of them say like they feel a bit kind of weaker strength wise yeah. probably because they're not eating enough iron they're not eating enough calcium for their bones and is the obviously protein is different in every food source so if you have an animal protein with certain bcaas it's going to be very different to if you have like tofu or soy yeah this is this is where it gets the yeah, interest in so if you're kind of like like us and we just eat like a, a, a meat diet a healthy balanced diet yeah no yeah. i'd say i'd quote I'd get told off for saying normal now i mean my ex-girlfriend was vegan she used to just like tell me off for saying like normal milk it's like well, it's not normal anymore is it it's plant-based <laughs> or it's animal based like, um well what sort of things do, do they have things like oat milk and stuff like that vegans or is it yeah is it to, oh, okay i have almond milk i think it's great i can't drink normal milk anymore I yeah just, i don't know why i can't stomach it really strange bit of a tangent isn't it but mm. i used to drink like pints of milk like really? skimmed milk what, just straight out the carton just... well, i mean i used to go to, like tesco and just buy some skimmed milk 20 grams of protein after training high end leucine so like promote muscle protein synthesis after training brilliant why did you Ma- stop doing that i had soy milk at my mate's house with some cereal and i was like yeah, this tastes like really nice because milk doesn't really taste of anything. It's just cold and refreshing. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, this soy milk tastes like really nice. And then ever since then, I just drink soy milk. So easy not, switch. Yeah, easy switch. Yeah, almond milk can't really do. It's quite it. sweet, isn't it? Almond milk. I don't know. I just don't think it tastes of anything. I just I like it in my coffee now. Yeah, like, it's, yeah. it is nice. Oat milk, almond. They've got so many alternatives in there. But that's another thing is when you look at the ingredients, it's only got like one percent of almond in or it's going to it's they're very low yeah this is this is it isn't it because milk you know from whether it's like a cow or a goat or whatever is like a natural product it's got carbs you know fats protein calcium etc um whereas these kind of products you've got to remember that they're they're man-made Mm. so they're not natural people say like oh there's i don't know what's in milk like we shouldn't be eating it drinking it sorry um 
but our milks and oat milks are all made in factories mm -hmm. and they've got vitamins and stuff added to them to compensate for that just like cereals so i think if you're kind of like vegan i'd try and promote having soy milk because it's soybeans are high in protein um some it may be the most kind of like calorific of them so i say like almond milk's got like no calories in it soy milk does have calories energy in it but it's kind of i'd say the most nutritionally kind of complete and you can get like a high i know one of the guys i work with has like a, a high protein one which has got um i think it's something like in 300 mil 350 mil like a glass i guess it's got like 20 grams of protein so that's pretty ideal to then have with some brown yeah. flakes or wheat bix or something it's mm. pretty good now th that's great I, what i want to go into is like weight loss now so when i was get, getting involved in boxing when i was involved in boxing 10 so years ago competing our coaches our sort of mentality was as we said before was one meal a day you know cut down on the water no water intake um yeah and go train two three times a day sometime mm. and go off that one meal how was how was sort of that advance now i know you notice you said about six meals a day that you give your athletes but how was sort of nutrition advanced now to the old mentality where people tell you go train on one meal um don't drink any water at night when you wake up now it's recommended to have water because yeah. you, you lose calorie over you lose sort of water intake overnight. Down then we couldn't go straight for a run. You know, that's your way of making weight loss. So how, how has that sort of changed now with the advancement in um, nutrition? And Just when you're talking about that, that there, it's just crazy to think that most people go to the gym and they go on their phones for like 45 minutes whilst they're training, doing bicep curls, mm. and they burn like 200 calories and they're eating ridiculous amounts or they think they're eating ridiculous amounts. And you were a boxer training like two, three times a day, you said, mm -hmm. and having one meal a day. Yep, one meal a and day. And probably burning that meal off in your first session. Yeah. It's just, just in my head, it's just crazy to think like that. Do you know what I mean? With general pop, just going yeah. to the gym and having like... Yeah. But I, I don't know, I think there's so many extremes out there, but like, especially with the old school way of like, let's say you eat in your one meal, let's say 900 calories. Like if you're crashing that diet, it's a matter of time until you can't perform anymore and you even said about overtraining what was you also eating that one meal a day when you were doing your sprints the day before a fight yeah so we do sp so we're doing sprints obviously making weight i was there was talk of me trying to get down to, so i was used to box at 60 kilos there was talk you can get down to 56. yeah it's always walking it's always walking 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 yeah yeah but then you yeah. know it, it was luckily my dad was around me saying no, you're not going down to 56 you're good 60 kilo um so yeah making 60 kilo was was tough as well uh, but you notice a difference. So when you're about 64, you feel strong, you feel fit. Yeah. Those last sort of four kilos can take it out of you. And I think nutrition would, uh, can help not only lose weight if you get it right, but can also make you that same strength and that same mm. strong feeling you can still hold. And, but what really changes, if you box at 60 or 64, really, to me, like, I don't, I, I, this is my opinion, but like I'll happily box a few kilos heavier against mm. the bigger guy if I feel naturally strong and fit in my weight. So I, uh, I got down to 64 kilos for Sweden and it was the first time I had a proper strength conditioning camp. It was brilliant. I didn't really box much, but um, the guy Howard that did it, all the work with me, it was great. Uh, I controlled my, my nutrition side of things, but I dropped probably about six kilos in two months. Not too bad, but it got to the point where now I'm looking back, I wasn't that strong at that weight and I happily would box at 69 kilos and fill out mm. like we were saying earlier like um, in the last year I've done a lot more strength conditioning I've looked after my body a bit more I've not cut anything out i am not cut any corners like if, if I feel hungry I'm gonna eat and uh, as long as it's the right food I feel better at that weight I'll, I'll happily box someone like you were saying you know you want to get down to 56 kilos oh, i don't want to i was no, told yeah, to get down yeah, to 56 yeah. not, that, not now <laughs> yeah oh not mate now. not now <laughs> definitely not now but like yeah to, to drop those kilos like you you might as well just say oh should i just box with no sleep as well Jeez. yeah it's just stupid i, I don't know that's my mentality it, it's, it's an it's an old school mentality you've got a lot of coaches still in the game i'm sure you work with some who who are who, who want to stick to their roots like this is your job now to sort of educate them and say, listen, this can help, I don't know, benefit him mm. 1%, which we always look for that 1% in the athletes, right? Yeah. And if we can get nutrition right, hopefully that can benefit boxers yeah. know, a lot. In and a I lot think of for me personally, I'm not doing this to make a load of money. Um, I'm doing it to help people do things better because I've seen some horrific stuff that 
you don't want to see people doing, where regardless if you're mates with them or you know you're fond of them or if they're a stranger, you don't want to see them doing the things that they're doing, like making weight and just you know seeing them in the gym and they're just sat there just all green in the face because they've got no energy and it being you know making themselves sick. There's just some ridiculous stuff. I mean, you've probably seen it in the amateurs, you know, people running in bin bags and stuff. I've done it. Yeah, 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 I've done, done it. Done it. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, I want to help educate coaches and as well and get them on board and the best kind of like clients or boxers that I work with we're kind of part we're you know we're a team so I can mm. say to the coach how is so-and-so doing and you know you know how are they performing in sparring like you know have you noticed a change in them and they said yeah I've noticed a big change you know and stuff like this it's difficult when you get a coach that's got their backs up against the wall and they're kind of stuck in their ways I'm kind of like now as kind of like a more mature practitioner or, or person I guess that I tend to just not work with with coaches that are like that because it can be very difficult to change behavior and I'm almost fighting an uphill battle but at the forefront all I'm trying to do is just make it better for their fighter yeah. which would then make it better for them so if their boxer or their you know combat athlete I guess is turning up to training sessions they're full of energy they're going to get more out of them and ultimately on fight night they're going to get a better fighter mm. so it's kind of like a win-win but sometimes yeah like you said it's, it's hard to to come in there as a fresh faced guy. I was going to say, like, how have, how have you sort of uh, coped with working with some of these coaches that have the old school mentality? But I think you've said that it's, it's been quite challenging, would you say? Would you say they're more accepted now? Yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's difficult for me because I don't come from a, I think I would have a lot more buy-in if I come, I'm open and honest to saying that. This. If, perhaps if I was an ex-boxer and I had less nutritional knowledge, I hadn't been to university, I'd get more buy-in. Hmm. But I think the number one thing is just time. I think you got to do, let sit in silence and let your results do the talking. As Mikey said last week, trust the process. You know, and I think he'll be open in saying, you know, that, well, with his fight before, you know, he went through a period where he's in lockdown, you know, put on some weight, didn't get any fight news. And he's open and honest and saying about, he said it on my podcast, he said it on other stuff that, that camp against Martin Harkin was just like a, a fat loss camp. It wasn't performance camp. It was literally just waking up every morning, scales, I was this, got to get out for a run, you know, got to get this weight off. There was n no focus on performance. Whereas, mm. you know, since he fought Chris Congo and moved on, obviously in the summer, it's all been about performance. We don't really talk about weight that much. It's, but that's like, yeah, you know, but that's also because you've just, been with him for time now, where it's natural, it's it's just a part of everyday like, life. How long have you worked with Mikey for? Um, about 14, 15 months now. So, about four, so was that just before the Congo fight, is that was that the yeah. first time you worked yeah. together with him? Yeah. And you saw how well he performed in that fight. Um, so, so going forward, now 15 months later, hopefully, yeah. breaking down, he's improved a lot more. The number one thing is that is as is, is well that is a good example, really good example for any professional or young and up and coming um, like professional athletes or boxers that he stays on weight or he stays within a weight percentage from his weight and weight outside of camp. Yeah. So I don't want to give like specific numbers, but he won't go above like a target, which I set. And that makes it when he comes into the camp, he's not starting off from, you know, plan C. He's starting off from you know, he's ready to go. He's fresh, yeah. He's ready to smash eight weeks. And he knows in the back of his head, like, if I'm this weight, I've done this before, I know that realistically, I don't have that much to lose. This is gonna be, I can just focus on performing. Because if I'm sparring and I'm doing X training sessions a day, the weight will come off. And if I follow what Jack says, the weight's gonna come off. So it's time and yeah, it's trust. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's the, you know, let the results speak for themselves and and how important with everyone you work with how important is it to be open-minded always learning i feel like like we said with old school mentality i think being open to new ideas trying things trial and error like it you need to be open-minded for you to always keep learning to always keep adding like, that's so important yeah and everybody's different that's the main thing there's there's no there's no blueprint and saying like okay buy this buy this plan for like 100 quid or 50 quid, you know, buy this plan, it will get you to your goal. Everybody's different, you know. Like you said before about the different diets, vegan diets, some people can't have caffeine, you know, some people don't eat until midday, some people train at X time, but everybody's different. So ultimately, you, you know, you as a boxer, as an individual need to know what works for you. You only know your body, 
you know, you know yeah. your body the best yourself, don't you? So yeah. you know what works for you, you know what doesn't work for you. So it's all about, like you said, trial and error. And so let's say right now, Terry was about to go in a camp for three months. How would you deal with him as a client? What, 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 what this weight? Yeah, <laughs> what would you measure? Let's say you wanted to get down to 64 kilos. Yeah. What, what would you advise him and what would you measure? So for people at home that are maybe interested in adding to their routine, to what they already do with their training, mm. what, what would you recommend like, if you were doing a camp with them? Yeah, first off, I'd send him quite a big invoice. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he'd be quite a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah, only a little. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess myself personally, and I know that other kind of like qualified sports nutritionists will operate with kind of like a four or five phase model. So the first things first, before I start working with anybody now, is that I get them in for some form of body composition analysis. Before they even pay, before they even, I, you know, sign up or whatever. I need to know what their current body is. Not just, oh yeah, I'm 73 kilos, mate. And they weigh themselves after training or at some random time. I need to know, standardized, how much fat mass they have, how much lean body mass they have, how much total body water they store, what their weight is, you know, not like after a spa, what it is on a Monday morning, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I can work out, okay, how are they gonna get to this weight class safely? And they'll then say, I wanna do X weight class. And I say like, yeah, no chance. We've done, we've done this. We've got the data in front of us to show you and your coach that you can't make that weight class. But the coach gone, oh, I reckon I could get, you know, I reckon I'll get eight kilos off him. But they're just looking <laughs> at him and it's just like, well, if we actually dig deeper into it and I crunch the numbers, it's not safe. So you can do it if you want. How would you declare but, what's safe? Like, so let's say Terry's got, I don't know, 20% body fat right now and he's got eight weeks. Yeah. Like what, what things would you put implement? What, what would you measure? Cause let's say you wanted to get down to 60 and he's currently 70 in eight weeks. Yeah. You, you'd be like, that's a bit too far. Yeah. Cause you've got to then determine basically how much weight they're going to lose per week. And you can have like an aggressive calorie deficit, a moderate or like a just kind of like, you know, okay, you know, average kind of calorie deficit. The more kind of aggressive you get, number one, you're gonna lose some muscle. It's just a byproduct. You, you, you can't lose no muscle. It's very rare for you to lose no muscle with the amount of training you do, the amount of stress you put your body under. So you're always gonna lose some muscle. Um, and as well with like, you know, aggressive calorie deficits, you're massively heightening your risk of getting ill and injured because your body's obviously like in a stress state, it's breaking itself down. So we would sit down and just kind of work out, you know, what weight class I think is best for you to make, where I'd want you kind of like seven days out, what's achievable through reducing kind of like body composition, and then what would be safe, you know, for, for you to lose in fight week, depending on what time you're weighing in, same day weigh-in, day before, um, what you've done before, et cetera. Um, and if you've rehearsed any kind of acute weight loss strategies outside of camp, like we were speaking off air, weren't we, about like fiber intake and amateur boxes, like have you tried you know, going on like a, a low fiber diet way out of season just to can see you uh, Can you describe that to people that might not understand low fiber diets? Yeah, sure. So I guess, yeah, if we were taking on Terry's example, we got to the end I'm of I'm a big camp. example today, ain't I? I'm like, oh, I'm <laughs> Everyone's trying to get me back in the ring, leave me alone. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'd get to kind of like the end of the fight camp per se, the last kind of like the taper phase, the last 10 days. Um, where really not much training is going to be going on, just working through tactics, short, sharp stuff, nothing intense. Um, I kind of like most of my pro guys sitting around like five, six percent above their kind of like weigh-in weight. Obviously, if they're any lower, then that's that's great. But I always say like between sort of like five and six percent of their body mass. So, for example, if it was a welterweight, sixty-six point seven. If they were entering fight week or ten days out, like seventy-one kilos that's perfect, we can guide them safely for an acute weight cut through that phase. Um, so like some of the stuff which you can do is you can naturally just reduce their carb intake down. So they're not gonna be training, so they don't need that fuel. So you can kind of give them like a low carb diet. They can quickly lose, like we said at the start, you can lose like two, three kilos, just reducing your carb intake. Mm. Um, and then obviously if they are doing training sessions, we can give them some carbs which they'll use immediately so if they've in fight week if they're doing like a you know for example it's just obviously we're at, got like the liam williams eubank fight they might have a little bit of carbs they might have a gel or they might have a couple of sweets or something just to have to give them that energy there and then but they're not going to store it they're going to utilize it straight away um so you can be clever with like the carb intake in fight week um 
you can then obviously reduce like the amount of fiber so this is one which is really good for amateurs so normally throughout like the whole of the camp or throughout the most of the year you want to have like a high fiber intake keep a healthy gut um obviously you know keep keep you full and stuff like that but it's kind of what we call dead weight so when you're trying to make a weight it doesn't really need to be there because if you eat all of like you know all bran and brown rice and you know quinoa and stuff water in the stomach intestine just absorbs that so it kind of like it absorbs all of it in the stomach and it's kind of just sits there in your gut so if we kind of have like a low fiber intake you can kind of get rid of that weight sat inside your gut so if you have things like white bread or you know simple swap oats for rice krispies or cocoa pops or something like that because amateurs don't really want to be cutting carbs in fight week because yeah. they don't have 24 38 hours to sometimes you have about one hour from well, in two hours sometimes less than that don't you yeah. so I've, I've had it where you've had half literally half an hour terry you're you're yeah. in i'm like oh, all right thanks <laughs> so you have a quick so yeah it's a quick turnaround but like you said off air as well so many amateurs should be around their fight weight anyway like yeah. you know if if you're going to find your natural fight weight that you're you're going to be fit and healthy mm. at you don't want to really be going a kilo over two kilos over when you're active no. so if you if you were two kilos over and you did switch to white white pasta white toast and everything for a couple of days cut your water intake a tiny bit yeah then perfect because mm. people forget as well that you're only boxing really for what nine minutes yeah and six answers. minutes sometimes, yeah. six, sometimes. Minutes. Six, 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 six six nine minutes it's not actually that long really um but it's not kind of like 12 rounds like yeah. it would be in the pro game so yeah. you, it's much faster much the pace faster, yeah. the pace uh, what my coach said to me once is like in 12 rounds you're much slower and you're but in nine minutes you're going to fit that in what they fit in 12 minutes so it's a yeah. lot faster that sort of pace but now with the as ashley said a few weeks back to me he says dur during the three three minute rounds you have to control yourself throughout the round mm. so it can be depends who you're fighting mm. comes down to who's so fighting. you don't have enough time to get any carbohydrates back in because that's the fuel source you're going to be using yeah. whereas you said correctly in in the pro game you know you spend a lot of time maybe on the back foot or moving around the ring where you're kind of like utilizing your aerobic energy system and then you go in for those combinations and those flurries where your heart rate's going to go up um but i guess amateur is going to be max intensity the whole way through mm. so if you if you kind of like have a low carb diet and fight week um, or a couple of days before and then maybe just have 30 grams or like a gel or like a cereal bar after the weigh-in it's not going to be enough so you're just going to fatigue so that's where the low fiber can be really useful and obviously cutting your water intake down a little bit because and what would you recommend let's say you've got an amateur boxer that's fighting in a couple of weeks so obviously whatever you eat on fight day hmm. you want to be eating on your sparring days you want to you want to practice what you're eating so when it's on the day it's the same thing but what would you recommend what type of foods what what type of obviously everyone's different but is there any any good energy sources any any little extras that you can add in your, in your day yeah so i guess the main thing is that like you said correctly you want to try it before you never try anything new on race day or event day or fight day um you want to rehearse something before so you need to find out what works best for you so sparring is the best opportunity to do it so say if you're sparring you know first thing in the morning so like maybe you're going to weigh in in the morning and then have like a couple of fights um amateur fights you want to try and rehearse what you've done before so stuff like after weighing in something that's really rapidly digestible so like maybe like an energy bake or cereal bar or some like quick like energy balls or flapjacks you know things like that which are high in carbs kind of like high in sugar um but digest easily really like small in volume as well so you don't want to have like a bowl of cereal it's not practical either to have a bowl of cereal mm -hmm. or like a wrap it's it needs to be something which is super quick to digest because you're about to go and box 30 minutes later like you said so it can't be sat in your stomach yeah so liquids as well like like a milkshake or smoothies Luke's or luke says sport yeah, yeah something that's really great to have so that's good to know yeah a few options for guys to play around with but i'd always say like have a go with it and sparring see how you get on you'll know which ones work for you like i know some guys that you know they, they can have a couple of like you know fruisley bars or whatever but a couple of other guys can't they have to have just like liquids so they have to have like a carb kind of like blend or they need to have a smoothie or they need to just have some fruit juice or coconut water or, or something they can't have solids yeah. but they've tried it in sparring so they know that yeah. they felt a bit heavy so they I, I can't eat i have to give myself two hours or so before i even do any high intensity because i can still feel it sitting there mm. two hours later um so like having like a small flapjack i think that's a really good tip yeah uh, and obviously after high performance 
how can you get the best recovery with food? Let's say mm. you've just had a fight. Let's yeah. say you're boxing every week. So uh, let's say you've got nationals coming up or you're at a good level. And boxing you're fight- three times in a week, maybe. Three, yeah. Mm. Or over a competition, you might box on a Friday, a Saturday, and the finals on a Sunday. Mm. What would you use uh, for nutrition and sleep, etc., uh, as a basic guideline for people that want to recover fast? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, they need to be getting something in their system straight away. There's not really much time to kind of wait around. You'd see like in professional football, in like the Christmas period, you see them if you watch on Sky Sports or whatever, you know, they're coming off the pitch and they're being handed a shake straight away. You know, there's no time for them to like shower and have a laugh and then go get some food because they need to recover quick to then be ready for the next game. So they've got a limited period of time to get, you know, carbohydrate stores maximized again and protein to recover. So usually something that's that's got both of those in it so you know around kind of like 50 60 grams of carbs so you could have like some like dextrose powder or something mixed with like whey protein or just good old-fashioned like you know like chocolate milk or something like that just so like, liquids straight after are quite a good way yeah li- calories. liquid straight away because it ticks all the boxes you get the fluid so you get the fluid back into the system you get electrolytes if you're having something like milk um, if you are going to have something maybe solid, pair it with like an electrolyte drink or like coconut water. So you could then go down that route of having like some coconut water with like a high protein yogurt and some banana or something. So you're kind of ticking those boxes or you could just have it all in one. So like, I know what's popular, you could have um, science and sport do like Rego powder, which is like protein and carbs and electrolytes. So you can have that maybe. So you with, just add a scoop to... So they come in little sachets now. So you mm. can get like a tub. Okay or like the little sachets. So you can put like some of them sachets in your boxing bag, take one out, mix it with some water, um, have a banana with it. And then you've got like 40, 50 grams carbs, 20 grams protein. And then What's that called? It's called Rego. Rego. Yeah. A lot of companies will do it. It's just the carb and protein, like whey protein blend. How, how would you say, for example, a bodybuilder that, that knows what they're doing with their nutrition intake, etc. How would they be able to optimize recovery after? Because I don't know if you've ever seen them with their weight cuts. They'll go on stage, they're shredded with low body fat. Mm. Do, you, do you know much about how they can recover fast on? Because they get to dangerous levels of low really? body fat. Yeah. I'm going to be honest, I don't, I don't really know too much about like bodybuilding comps or how they work or or kind of anything. It's more like boxing. So Fair enough. I don't want to like comment and give some yeah. like advice yeah, yeah, like yeah. if I don't know, do you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah. let's talk about fasting. Sure. Uh, obviously, I've seen some of your posts as well. I like to fast. I feel mentally switched on with it. Um, obviously, if I've got a big training session, I'm going to eat before. Um, that's like natural. Yeah. But I've tried it. I've tried fasting. But two hours later, I get hungry. <laughs> so, um, so I kind of stick off that. Uh, can you first describe fasting to people in basic terms and then your view on it? Yeah, so I guess fasting is just a period of time where you go without eating. <laughs> um, so for some people, it might be they go to bed at 10 p.m. and they don't eat till 11 a.m. the next day. That's still a that's still a period of fasting. Mm. Um, someone might say, "Oh, you're intermittent fasting," which just be like, "Well, I'm just not." And then someone else would say, "I'm just not eating till 10 a.m. because I'm going to wake trend, up." Isn't it? It's a bit yeah. of a fad now. It's a bit of a you know, if someone just doesn't, if they're busy or their schedule dictates what they're doing, like they're not intermittent fasting. Well, they are, I guess, but they're not doing the quote unquote intermittent fasting diet. If that makes sense, mm. it's just a period of just not putting anything into your body. Um, do you and every- think it has a good effect on some people? Is, can it be a positive? This is the thing, it's all individual. Like I know some fighters that can go and do like a morning session and they don't want to eat before and they feel okay with it, but then they're going to be hungrier later on in the day. And then I know some people that literally are thinking about breakfast before they go to bed. <laughs> I think it's just totally individual. I think it's what works for you, whether you want to be a vegan, whether you want to intermittent fast. And if someone comes to me and says, this is what I want to do, I'll be the one that works around it. I'm not going to tell them like, okay, if you work with me, you have to be vegan. Or if you work with me, you're not eating till midday. You would you, you'll adapt, adapt to them. To I'll adapt to, to whoever's put in front of me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So. Well, what's quite interesting about intimate fasting, obviously I, I joke around with it. I've tried it before. Um, and some people that I've spoken with and researched that I've seen is that it can help with Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer's as well. It can help reduce the chances of getting Alzheimer's. But I, I, just because you're, you're using that resources in your body that, that you wouldn't normally use yeah and it could, there's that sort of research shows it's good for that side of things i don't know if you've heard much about that as well not really to be fair but obviously people do going off a tangent but people do ramadan don't they so mm-hmm. you know you see like professional footballers and that they, yeah they're doing 
90 minutes but without they do dry fasts they can't drink that, water as that well, gets a bit worrying because obviously yeah. when you start you know when you're dehydrated in your kidneys and that you can get kidney failure and yeah yeah that, that can and be i think as well people, people say they're intermittent fasting but it's like we were going back and saying how people on the vegan diet they're having the chicken nuggets and stuff people do intermittent fasting and then they have like coke zero or they have tea with like almond milk oh, almond milk's only got like two calories in it so i'm intermittent fasting it's like well I think the original idea was you just don't like, put anything into your body. Just water. Just water. But now people are thinking like, well, I can have like a Coke Zero, or I can have a black coffee. And it's almost like they're trying to, they know what they're doing is kind of bad, like they should be having breakfast, but they're trying to trick their body into what they're doing is, you know what, no, I am doing the right thing. And like when the, people do start adding those Coke Zeros and that, you are going to get hungry and ravenous and, because you're already putting chemicals and that in your gut anyway. We'll talk about gut health in a bit. Um, but that's that's not good. That, it, it can't be good for you. If you're having just Coke Zeros all morning, and you think that you're being healthy, <laughs> yeah, yeah you're finished. better off. You're better off having breakfast. And from my experience, I know that most people that don't have breakfast, as an example, will just typically not not for everybody. Everybody's different, but you know, most people will just then overeat the rest of the day. Uh, so obviously, let's talk about gut health as well. So your hormones, uh, your gut. It's so important. You have got kilograms kilos of gut bacteria so mm -hmm. literally bacteria sitting in your stomach so it's so interesting can you tell us a bit about that it is yeah and i think it's probably one of the things which people forget to look after they look after you know everything else but they don't look after kind of like their gut health and what kind of like they're putting into their body and there's that old saying isn't there that my, you know your body's a temple and everything that you put into it is going to have and this is the interesting thing what i found with working with boxers is that when they're looking in, especially in camp, maybe out of camp, not so much, but when they're in camp, they're looking at everything that they put into their body. You know, they think, what benefit is that going to have to me? What, what benefit is that going to have to me in training? If I eat that meal before training, is that going to help me train? You know, and there's a lot of superstition of boxers. If something works well, they'll just keep having it. Like if they have something before sparring, they ain't going to change up. I'm like with, with some of my like plans. Like a Kit Kat or something. Yeah, if, yeah. I, if I'm working yeah. with like some of my boxers, they say like, oh, should we try and have like, you know, like maybe like Bircher before instead of porridge? They're like, no, 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 no. I've done really well in that spot. I don't want to change it. So they always have kind of like the same thing, but. It's, uh, it's quite a big thing. Like the superstitious. I remember a guy I used to box with in his box. Every time we used to box together, he had a tin of beans in his bag. I was like, why you got a tin of beans in your bag? He said, Terry, this is my good luck charm. What, what kind of beans? <laughs> it's like black beans. Oh, okay. oh, black beans. Oh, okay. Did he eat them or did he just carry them around? He just kept, carried them around. It's weird. <laughs> so cool, cool run-ins with the lucky egg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lucky beans. So. Um, but yeah, with gut health, I mean, if you've got like a bad gut or quote unquote like a leaky gut or, or something like that, you know, you're congested all the time, constipated. You're not going to be able to train properly. Um, and there's been like a, we were saying about vegan diets and how that's kind of been a trend. There's been a trend recently of, you know, looking after your gut, which is a good thing. Things like probiotics, you see everywhere now, you can get like kefir, everything, and yeah. sauerkraut and kimchi and all this kind of stuff. And I always say to people, you gotta try and look after your gut health just as much as you look after, you know, all other, all other aspects of your health and including things in your diet, such as like pro and prebiotics, you know. The easiest one to be fair is just like you said, having maybe a bit of kefir yogurt or like fermented foods? Fermented foods, just having... Well, what's fermented foods? So they're kind of... Well, do you want to talk about it a little bit, Ash? Uh, well, so I don't really it. have it myself, to be fair, but like things like kefir or uh, sauerkraut, like you said, they're like the main things, or kimchi. Uh, it's just foods that have been like, like fermented, like just kept around for ages, I guess. Yeah, okay. so um, it's got bacteria, that healthy bacteria has grown on them. Great. But it's always when I say we're of nutrition, keep it simple, keep it practical. Yeah. I don't know any boxers that are going to go out to Waitrose later and buy some kimchi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, true. They, they ain't going to do it. Yeah. Um, but like, and they're unlikely. Or, they're unlikely to go and buy some kefir yogurt. So the easiest way to do it is just giving them like a yakult or an actimel or something like that. It's just easy. They just have it. They can buy it. Have it in one. It tastes okay. And then that's kind of like that kind of looked after. But there's so many elements of boxing, isn't there? Keeping things simple is the best thing. Oh mate, honestly, like yeah. I've been there myself and trying to do things complicated and really go into detail with science and stuff. It just, it just doesn't work. And, um, you know, Mikey's a good example. It's just like, he ain't got time. He's got interviews, he's got triple training days. He's got like his daughter, he's got, you know, girlfriend and, and everything. It's, it's, it's too much. You can't, you got to keep things simple. And like I said, he's not going to go down to Waitrose and buy some kimchi or some sauerkraut. It ain't going to happen. So it's, what can you do to make it the most simplest thing possible, which fits into their routine? Um, 
and like I said, if it is having like a if it is having like a yakko or if it is having like a protein powder after training instead of going home and making some smoothie because he ain't gonna go home for another two hours because he'll go to school, pick his daughter up, etc. It's what's finding the easiest way, to, but we're still ticking the box. Yeah, I think a, a lot of things with your gut health, a lot of man-made chemicals are being put in things now. So you see protein bars, they got no carbs. But then you look in the back, it's like hydrolyzed fat. <laughs> they've got like, they've done chemical reactions to already previous stuff just to like get rid of that macros. Mm -hmm. And your body is not used to digesting stuff like that. So again, your gut, when you're putting in things that aren't natural, when you, when you not, aren't eating natural foods and you, you've got all these complex chemicals that are going, that can't be good in the long run. Like your body doesn't know how to digest it. And I think your gut health obviously is so interlinked with your, your, your brain and your mental health that um, when, you, when you do start putting those chemicals and that in your body, you might as well go back to, like you said, the basics. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And there's been a lot of research which is linked, um, yeah, gut health to mental health as well. Like they're on wow. the same, they're on the same connection. Mm -hmm. Everything's interlinked, you know, your brain and your muscles, your brain and your gut, your gut's still a muscle at the end of the day. So everything's linked together. And um, yeah, having a healthy gut can help with like healthy mind as well. So you gotta look 100%. after, you gotta look after everything. So especially if you're doing boxing, you know, so. Like anyone that's listening, anyone that's literally got a diet planned and they're on it and they're, they're feeling good, just because you're eating healthy, no matter what the diet is, if you're eating healthy and you're feeling good about it, like your, your gut health is probably pretty good because mm. you're, you're not eating McDonald's every day anymore, you're not eating big chocolate bars. If you're doing any kind of these diets and you're doing it correctly, then yeah, you start feeling happier mentally you just, mm. and yeah, it's such a big difference. And again, that starts linking with your hormones. Yeah. and. Don't know if you want to talk about optimizing hormones like naturally like testosterone is so big of course yeah and you see from there was some really super interesting data they done a, a followed um up at liverpool john moore's university they followed an mma fighter that was cutting um a ridiculous amount they of cut stupid amounts don't they? I, he was cutting like 18 percent of his body weight or something 18 you percent know, something ridiculous anyway they 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 didn't want to help him because it ethically they, they couldn't help him because it's like, well, you, what you're doing is just, but we're going to observe it and we're going to document it to show people this is not what to do. So was this the guy that was like held up by other people on the way in? Is, is that the I video? Can't, I can't remember his name, but I'll, I'll dig the research paper out and send it over to you after. But they basically observed him and some, they observed like they monitored like his bloods and stuff in fight week and throughout the camp and his testosterone levels and his creatinine levels. And his testosterone levels were like dangerously low, like the lowest that have been, they couldn't find any like low testosterone levels in research papers. Wow. wow. Like, and that was from extreme weight cutting. And that guy then went on to then fight, oh. and, and you know, like an MMA fight. I, I yeah, that's, that's the worst part. Like, it's yeah. not just he cut that weight. It's he like, had to go and fight. Been, yeah. But you hear this a lot in the MMA sport. Like you see documentary, you see Khabib, you see, but uh, they allow it. That's the problem because it's, it's it's just part of, it's part of their the way of yeah. it's the way of life now. Like the UFC, everyone does the weight cut. They're all in saunas. They're doing hot and cold therapy. They're all cutting. But like, there, there that, needs to be more rules around that sport. Don't like they? they should just do a hydration clause. Like a lot of boxers, yeah. like um, when Canelo's fought in the past, they'll say you can't put any more than maybe five kilos mm. uh, within <laughs> fight day. You know, you get guys that can balloon up 10 kilos in 24 hours, 10 kilos, mm. 10 kilograms. So yeah, I think having like a clause put that you can only cut a certain amount away, it's just for your health. You know, no one knows the long-term risks yet. When your internal organs are being deprived of so much, like, you know- It's being cut off so much in that short amount of time as well. Well, it's quite a long amount of time. It's mm. normally three months this slowly starting to burn, burn off weight, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, and but then uh, in 24 hours they then the drop a cut. huge. You know, well, what's the average in like? I don't know if you know much about MMA. What, what sort of weight cut do they normally do? Well, they cut a lot in in fight week itself. They you know up to like 10, 11, 12 percent. Um, there's actually a documentary. I don't know if it is the guy that they followed, but it's on like it's on YouTube. It was on BBC, BBC Three, I think it was. Where they followed this guy from Liverpool that that done this weight cut. Hmm. Um, and if you watch it, it's like. I showed my dad it and I was like, yeah, this is, <laughs> check this out. Um, some guy that's just literally just cutting weight, like he's up all night, just like out in and out the bath, like sucking on ice cubes, spitting them out, like lost something ridiculous, like seven kilos of water or something in the last, like he's up all night, no sleep, weighs in and then goes and fights some guy the next day. It's just like- So dangerous. It's just like, wow, you're getting, taking all that water around from, around your head and then you're getting, brutally punched in the head it's just 
yeah, MMA is crazy. Yeah. Um, so back to testosterone. Uh, obviously, to get any hormones in your body, it comes from fat. So all of the fats that you eat, obviously, that gets turned into your hormones. Um, so people that have low fat diets, yeah, you know, how badly can that affect your, your testosterone levels? You know, if, if you can't eat your healthy fats like avocado and salmon or whatever it is. Yeah, it's always catch twenty two because because people see like you know obviously like fats if people don't know fats got like nine calories per gram so compared to carbs and protein they're four so it's almost like double the energy you get from the same amount of fat if that makes sense so people are scared to have them because more calories more weight they're not gonna lose weight etc but if you're not including like healthy fat sources like you said like salmon avocado walnuts chia seeds olive oils things like that your body's not gonna be able to absorb fat soluble vitamins so basically every vitamin apart from um vitamins um b and c because they're water soluble so we basically consume them and they go straight out so if you consume excess vitamin c we just wear out all of the other ones we absorb in like like you said through um like hormones through like fat cells so if, if we're like not eating enough like dietary fat we're not going to absorb those vitamins so that's when you can get fatigue and it's usually to be fair from what i've seen fat intake is usually one which suffers the most because mm. i think now there's been a because of all you know we've spoken about it in depth but fighters know that they need to eat carbs now like yeah. i think that's something which has come on massively in the last like two three years like yeah. they know they need to be doing it and if they aren't they know subconsciously that they're doing it wrong but before i think they realized that they didn't know if they needed to or not protein obviously everyone knows they need to eat protein that's like massive i think fat is now the one which i see a lot is getting under consumed yeah um so how, how would you, again, it's hard because everyone's different, but when you are counting your macros for a lot of, for a lot of fighters, how would it vary? Because obviously, like we were talking earlier about restrictive diets, if someone's on uh, vegan diets, mm. they're probably not really getting that much, well, unless they're eating lots of avocados and nuts, they probably are not getting that much BCAA proteins and they might be under, undercutting on the fats as well if mm. they've got high carbs. How would you try and promote a balanced diet like what would be your macro percentages without without trying to complicate things yeah i get what you're saying i get what you're saying i always try and work off grams per kilo because percentages can be a bit misleading so if i had 500 calories a day and i said my protein's 30 percent 30 percent of 500 is only like 100 and whatever calories which is only <laughs> do you know what i mean so percentages can be a bit like misleading so it's best to go off like grams per kilo yeah so if you were to go you know one that's heavily referenced in um, like combat sports literature is kind of going with like a three to one approach. So you kind of go, it's easy to remember. You can fluctuate kind of like under and over it, but rule of thumb, kind of like three grams per kilo of carbs. So if you're like a 70 kg athlete, like welterweight as an example, kind of like 200 grams carbs a day, just as a rough number, gives you something to work with. Protein, two grams per kilo. So if you're 70 kg, 140 grams, so you've got 210 carbs, 200, 210 carbs, 140 grams of protein, 150 grams of protein, um, and then around one kilo gram per kilo of fat. So again, 70 grams of fat. So that kind of gives you your macros and that will probably be like 1,800 calories, something like that. And then if you're kind of really needing to cut weight, you can pull the carbs down a little bit. You can pull like the fat down a little bit. You can kind of play around with it. Um, but that gives you like a rough kind of like guideline to go with, if that makes Three, sense. Two, one. That's, I've never heard that. That's yeah, that's that's really but it's easy to remember. Yeah. Um, it's easy to remember in the back of your head, you know, it's like a football formation, you know, three, two, one, it's easy, to, it's easy to kind of like remember when you're kind of like working towards targets. Um, and obviously if you've got less weight to cut, you can have way more carbs and so you might have six to one. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, you know, if you're holding a weight um, and you can just fuel your sessions, like you want to eat more carbs. So why not? Why uh, not? I think the yeah. more you can eat whilst cutting weight, the better. Like if, if I, for example, let's say my maintenance calories are I don't know, 2,600 or something for me to maintain. Mm. Then if I was to do a bit more exercise, go on longer walks, do some zone free, whatever, you know, if, if I can just burn more calories in my day and it means I can eat more healthier, better foods, mm. then I can actually, you know, instead of me trying to focus on eating only less than 2,000 calories a day to lose weight, if I can do more in my day, burn more, which isn't actually, you know, consuming like muscle fatigue or whatever, you, you're not going high intensity, I think that is the future. A lot of people can be lazy. They might sit around all day, go to a boxing session, and then just not eat that much. Mm. But like, if you find someone, like when I was working as a laborer in Sydney, 
Like if you're working 10 hours all day and then you're training maybe twice a day and coaching, because you're doing so much and you can eat so much, like, you know, I, I was still losing weight, but I was, I was not that strict of a calorie deficit and I, I, it's the best I ever felt. So I mm. think a lot of people, you don't want to be lazy with the approach. You don't just want to cut your foods out. You want to increase your, your basic work capacity. Work harder. It's so important. Yeah. That's why he's got the Australian accent. <laughs> so just looking forward for, for for you jack so what do you reckon the future i don't want to say the future of boxing with nutrition but what do you think the boxing world can do better to incorporate nutrition into into the sport i think more from like grassroots i think the best way is, is always going to be education Good. yeah um and i think that getting people like myself or other you know nutritionists etc to come in and actually like speak to parents at amateur level because we kind of form habits from a young age that we take forward that's why them kind of like old school coaches they get it from a generation above them so if we're kind of nipping it in the bud and educating parents and athletes before they kind of get into the pro ranks like mm. if you ask mikey like if he knew all of this stuff earlier on it would have made the first kind of like 20 fights way way more easy but he's only kind of like learning it as I, like i've met him i guess you know what yeah. i mean so yeah. it's he's learning it later on so if you can kind of learn all of the stuff around nutrition and behavior change and stuff like that at a young age you're more likely gonna take it forward with you into the kind of like the program same with any sport though isn't it like football if you learn at the academy level you're gonna take it forward into that's one thing i've i've seen massively is like if i look at other sports so when i was in scotland working over there you had the swimmers olympic swimmers they had nutritionists if you look at footballers they got nutritionists look at all these other sports They've got nutritionists, strength conditioning, even sports psychologists helping them yeah. to, to get to peak performance. And boxing, because of that old, old school mentality, I would say, and it's, it's not, again, I would not say it's a bad thing, but it's slowly get building up to get, raising its standards to sort of uh, get, get athletes to the top performance, would you say? Yeah, and another thing which I've learned practically as well is that those sports which perhaps have the money invested in them, hmm. to have a nutritionist that, at like a football club as an example, isn't the same in boxing. So naturally someone will come to you and say like, listen, I've got this fight coming up. I really need like a, a, a meal plan or I need a bespoke plan tailored around me, but they've only got 70 quid to give you. You're a businessman, you can't survive a business of that. So you've then got to think on your feet and think like, right, I can't spend X amount of time doing that. Otherwise I may as well just, you know, go work at supermarket or something. Cause yeah. I'm gonna get the same money for the time I'm putting in. Yeah. So you've got to be clever with your time and say like, okay, well maybe someone at this level who can afford to pay this, I can do it all bespoke for them. But someone at perhaps a lower level, like an amateur that really needs a bit of help, how can we kind of like adapt to help them? So it's well, going to be for education. You're doing a lot of online coaching as well, right? So you can just give tips just so people can add to their arsenal. So like, let's say you were just wanting to add, if you already had a good routine and you know, training's going well, but you, you were wanting to try and add lots of little extra bits you're, you're doing that with a lot of guys right so i guess yeah the way that i kind of work with with um boxers or professional kind of like fighters and amateur fighters is that like you said i'll have a service in place for those maybe that are fighting on tv or got a sponsorship behind them and they kind of want to take all the stress away and i'll plan what they need to eat and when and like devise like a i guess like a meal plan around their training schedule um like i said it, it takes quite a lot of time to do that um <laughs> when you're trying to do it bespoke around someone's, you know, dietary preferences, their kind of like training schedule, their home life, etc. It it's, takes a lot of time to plan around that. So I only offer that for like a handful of people. And like you said, the rest of it is kind of like online coaching. So I've got like quite a lot of lower level pros or guys that are just into boxing or doing it to keep fit or they've got a white collar fight where I'll be there in their corner to support them. But like I said, we'll just be working on like day to day habits, behavior change, you know, tracking towards like calorie macronutrient targets, you know, giving them example kind of like days of what they, this would look like and then giving the onus on them. So, um, yeah, I find that works quite well because I think that me personally, I train as well and I like to take responsibility for what I'm putting into my body and responsibility for what I'm training. I don't really want to give the onus to somebody else. Mm. I don't want someone telling me that like I'm going out with my mates later to watch the rugby. I don't want to like someone to tell me that I can't have like some food at the pub. Do you know what mm. I mean? I, I know what's sensible to have. Mm. Like I've got training tomorrow morning. I, I know what's sensible for me to be eating tonight. I'm not gonna have like a beef burger or, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. I, I don't wanna like plan, but when it's in camp and they say like, you know, I've got this TV on Sky Sports, like I need to be X weight. You can't really have any guesswork. And it's different when you've got six, eight weeks, but for amateurs or someone that's just doing it for like fitness, 
you need to be more focused around education. So I'm quite heavy on educating people so that they can be with me for a couple of months and then I don't want them staying around too long, even if I really like them, you know. Yeah. If I've done, if I've not, if they're with me for six months, yeah, I've done something wrong. Do you know what I mean? It's the same with maybe a personal trainer, I guess, or maybe a little bit different, but if you're still with the same one, maybe they haven't taught you enough. You're sort of pretty much setting them up just so they, they have enough habits that they can just go away and do it themselves. Yeah. Exactly. What's your views as well on uh, cheat meals or cheat days? <laughs> Give me some context. So, like, for who? So, let's say you're an amateur boxer. You're <laughs> sitting around your weight, but you know it's it's a Friday night, and you want to order. You know, you want to treat yourself. Training's going well. Would you recommend? Like, is it uh, bad? Amigos. Is it good? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like amigos. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult one because uh, the way I always frame it is, I said, you know, I think cheat days and cheat meals and stuff. It's kind of like we've demonized it a little bit with the whole wording around it. Cause I always say like, well, would you, I always say to someone like, would you cheat on your missus? So you're not gonna cheat on your diet, but you know, can you be a bit flexible with it? Yes. Um, I can't say that to my missus though. Don't say that, don't, <laughs> don't, say, don't say that to your missus that you're gonna be a bit flexible. Um, but yeah, it's like a cheat meal implies that you're cheating on your diet and you need to cheat, but really it's just potentially just having like a social occasion in the calendar where you're just going to be a bit more relaxed um, and take think, your foot off the gas. I think that's so important. I think I, for you to not feel restricted, I think I, like for me personally, I feel a lot better knowing that I can eat what I want when I want, but mm -hmm. I'm going to eat healthy the majority of the time. Mm -hmm. And then if something comes up like a, you know, like a birthday or whatever, then eat what you want, you know, have, have a dessert. Yeah. And this yeah. is where it can get dangerous as well. Like I just used the example of me today, for example. I mean, I've got no, I'm not trying to make a weight or anything. So, but if I say like went to the pub later or something and I was tracking my calories or I was, you know, psychologically as well, if your mates are around you or you're going to like a social occasion and you can't have like some popcorn if you go to cinema or something, psychologically it has a massive impact on you. Yep. And I know that a lot of boxes that I work with, pro boxes, you know, for example, Valentine's coming up next week. My goal is to make sure that all of the boxes that I'm in camp with at the moment can go out and have a Valentine's meal. Hmm. I don't want them to sit at home and their missus is like, you know, get all upset and have a go at them, whatever, because they can't go out. They can go out if we've kind of planned for it accordingly and they Be smart have the, and they have the right choice. They don't have like four beers and like a tiramisu and like a massive pasta dish. They're just sensible with what they have. You can work these things in. It, it can cause um, mentally a lot of stress on yourself, as you said as well. Like, I've done it before. You go out to parties, you go to cinemas, you go and you, you're like, oh, I can't have it. And normally people say, what's up with you? I don't know if you've had it before, Ash. Oh, yeah, All I the like, time. I like Christmas as well. Yeah, you know. like, what, what's up with you? You've, people think you're unsociable. But now, as you said, there's ways that you can work around it. And I think that's so key, that education side of thing now. And that, that, that's why I see nutrition as a big thing going and forward. And it's people putting pressure on themselves as well. Like, if you've got a big, big fight coming up, the motivation's different. Like, you could, might have that mindset of, I'm not going to go for a Valentine's meal. I'll go for one next year. I'll go for one when I'm retired. Mm -hmm. Just make your own Valentine's Day up but, yeah. after, after the fight. <laughs> perhaps if you're someone that's just doing it to keep fit or you're just a white collar fighter, yeah. you're doing it ultimately because you enjoy it. You're not doing it because you're getting paid for it. You're not doing it because you're making a career out of it. Mm. You're doing it because you enjoy it and, it and it benefits you mentally and physically. So why would you let it disrupt like the rest of your life? Yeah, mm. I think that makes sense. Yeah. do what you enjoy. Like I, I actually enjoy the sacrifice. Like there's nothing better than when I'm when I'm eating everything perfectly. Like I feel at my happiest. Mm, like even though a lot of people would be like, "What?" But like, don't you mm. want to go out and have a have a kebab or something and a beer? Well, no, I'd rather pressure, actually. Yeah. I'd rather have an early dinner, mm. have an, a good night's sleep, and uh, go training. Uh, but that's you know that's my mindset. That's how I'm happy. But you know if you're happy to have a cheat meal, or you're happy to be strict all the time. Then I think it's a key thing. You say. If you eat well, you feel happy naturally, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. If you feel where if you have things like kebabs, you feel more. I don't know. I feel lazy and I feel tired and you don't want to do anything. Yeah. Mm. So there's you know there's research behind that as well that shows that. Just on, I want to touch on the last sort of point for, for yourself is going forward. Uh, Jack, going forward, so what does the future hold for yourself in nutrition in boxing? Um, for me personally, um, I just want to keep working with, I'm at a stage in my life where I just want to work with people that I enjoy working with. Mm. For me, that's massive. It's like I said, it's not so much about the money. Obviously it is because I've got to pay my rent and stuff like that. But I mean, I want to work with people that I enjoy working with because that's ultimate fulfillment. I don't want to be working with people that a kind of or coaches that are up against what I say because I just don't have the energy to kind of combat it. It's like if I was to go work 
I don't know, John Lewis or something, I'm not going to get that stress. I'm going to get paid, I'm going to go home, I'm going to go see my mates. I'm going to have a, a nice-ish life, do you know what I mean? Mm. I don't... For me, it's, it's working with people who I want to work with, helping them do things better and ultimately just keep on raising the bar, keep on getting better and being involved with some, some big fights because ultimately when you get someone to that level, it's so rewarding seeing them perform at the big stage and you've played a part in that. For me, for me personally, it's, it's wicked. That's, that's all you've been working on. That's, that's, that's everything. Exactly, yeah. that's, that's all we've been working towards. So. Well, you've got a big fight coming up soon, right? Yeah, so uh, obviously Mikey's fighting on March 19th in America. So yeah, Mikey McKinson, yeah. So yeah, looking forward to that one. Um, obviously going to the States and nice. getting him on weight safely and fueling him up to, to beat Ortiz. It's the oh, goal. Yeah. Uh, so last question oh, for all of the people listening that just want to add something to their everyday life if they could add absolutely anything just to be a bit better like obviously like you said you do a bit of online coaching what advice can you give people just to be a bit healthier to to be in a better position like someone that maybe not even trains you know they run once a week don't really have a diet i'll tell you what we'll do five yeah I'll, I'll do no I will do six. Yep. I'll do two. You do two, and then you do two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I say for me, number one is get outside. Not people do not get outside enough and get in fresh air. Don't get enough sunlight. If you can get out for like you know with people working from home and stuff, going for a walk, just going for a run. You know people complain about like gym memberships are expensive. Get a pair of old running trainers. Go for a five k run. It's free, and the benefits for your mental health are just. I never used to run. Started running in lockdown. For me personally, with all the stress of answering messages and pressure of social media and everything consuming you, just leaving my phone at home, going for a run and just being in nature, it's just, it does so much to you mentally. And for me, number two, I've realized it recently as well is sleep. I know we spoke about it, but the difference between me getting six hours sleep and me getting eight hours sleep. I was at the gym the other day, um, the boxing gym with some of the guys and I had to get up for work, my other job really early in the morning and I only had like four hours sleep. I don't know what's wrong with me, I'm overthinking stuff, I think. And I just felt my appetite was up, like we said before. I was contemplating training and then I just sacked it off because I was like, there's no point in me training because I'm not going to get any benefit from it. I'll do 20 minutes and then just gas because I'm just not feeling good. So sleep is just, yeah, for me, getting outside, doing some exercise outside or just going for a walk. Um, and uh, yeah, sleep. Nice. I'd say definitely don't overeat. That's that's such a big one. Don't overeat. Like, do you know when when you're full and you think, oh, should I have a bit more? Don't. That that that's such a big thing. Uh, sleep. I was actually going to say is so important. But second one, have a good diet, but do whatever's best for you. You know, make your meals in advance. Do your food shop a week in advance. Get your dinners planned. That way, you know, it doesn't get to the evening and you order a takeaway. If you can actually get a bit of a plan in your week, a bit of a structure, then you're going to be able to follow something a lot easier. So that would be my number two. Hmm. I would say getting outside. I think during lockdown, the last couple of years, uh, I don't know if you guys have felt it, but being stuck inside has really, it can have really effects on your mental health. I think getting outside, doing stuff in a fresher, you know, running, walking, so beneficial. Uh, getting out in the nature, as you said as well, Jack. I think yeah, that's yeah. I think that's really important. Um, so you got to say two more, then, mate. <laughs> yeah, Jack. Yeah. Oh, jump, no, yeah. jump, jumping on our yeah. ones, isn't he? No, I, well, I'm going to say sleep as well. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think sleep's key. Yeah, for, for me, I've, I've only learned about this before. I used to get five, six hours sleep, you know, a day. But this has helped. The the, uh, the watch it helps track yeah. your helps track your sleep. You know how much sleep you get in your deep sleep. And stuff like that so that's been i think beneficial as well, for I think me as well. well just just to kind of wrap up i guess is that people and i've been guilty of it and it's probably with young people as well is that you feel such pressure just all the time to just be helping other people or firing all cylinders and i've been guilty of it it's just not looking after yourself and the way i've done it now is just turn my phone off put yourself first as we, well. we if my dad and people you know his age like my parents and stuff like it's very simple they would work nine till five and then weekends they switch off and I'm kind of envious of some people that get to do that in a way I am an aunt because you know I've had full-time jobs and it's not for me but hmm. you kind of forget that people that can just switch off but I think sometimes you sit there and like you're watching the boxing in the evening but you're still scrolling on your phone looking at stuff and it's just like just just kind of like turn it off you know 
how, get into a bedtime routine, get outside, you know, when you're exercising, do your exercise. Like, don't be like on your phone or doing bits and bobs whilst you're trying to do a gym session. Like that's your only hour to exercise in the day. Like that's your time, protect it. Hmm. It's something I've become very conscious of is when I go for it, that's why running is the best thing. Cause you just get out, you run, you do your exercise, you feel great. And one of the um, easiest things you can do is either. Yeah, exactly. So I think people need to stop putting so much pressure on themselves and just look after their mental health and prioritize their health, you know, before other people's things massive. Brilliant. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Yep. Thank you very much everyone for listening. Obviously we've got Jack Coke. Thank you for your time today, buddy. Uh, it's been um, awesome. It's been awesome, guys. Thanks for um yeah, thanks for listening to what I'd say and having me on. Nah, brilliant. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you everyone. Have a good day. Cheers.